who desperately need it. Thank you, Senator McKim. At now being 2 p.m., we'll move to question time, and I call Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, uh, Senator Wong. Um, Minister, how many suburbs chosen as part of your solar battery grant program are held in, in Labor held seats? Minister Wong. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Rustin for the question, and thank you, President. Uh, uh, I uh, assume that should actually be addressed to me as the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, but I, I will check who has responsibility for that program uh, and the status of that program and where, um, uh, where approvals under that program are at. I don't have personal knowledge of that and you wouldn't, I, I, frankly, expect me to. But I would make this point. Uh, today, we, today we have... Today we have... I'll take it on note. Just, I'll t I, 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 I'll take it on notice, uh, uh, and we will retur I'll return with some further information from the relevant minister, uh, as is appropriate. But I would make this point: uh, what we are seeing, what we saw today in the chamber, was the majority of this chamber vote uh, for a plan to get to net zero. Senator Rustin, you support net zero, don't you? Do you? Yeah, I assume um, so. Senator I assume Wong's even the moderates chair. in the Liberal Party still um, support it. Senator Wong, I, I'm very Senator happy to give Wong, you time to talk. Please resume your seat, Senator Rustin. Yeah. Um, on direct relevance, um, President, um, if the minister um, doesn't know the answer and has taken the question on notice, um, there is, there, and, and she doesn't wish to be relevant to the question in her additional comments. I would ask her to perhaps just uh, take it on notice. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Rustin. Uh, that's not a point of order. The minister has taken it on notice and she's entitled to continue her remarks. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you. Uh, certainly, uh, if um, I do recall that we, we had a, a very clear election commitment to roll out community batteries across Australia. Uh, we announced a number of batteries as election commitments. Uh, I understand that the proposals for the first 58 locations are currently being assessed by via the Government Business Grants Hub after submissions closed in January. I also am advised that commitments were made in a number of seats, coalition seats, uh, including, uh, including Leichhardt and Bowman. But I would make this point. I'd make this point. I would make this point. Uh, Senator Rustin, and I know she's got a lot on her mind, but Senator Rustin uh, has, uh, comes in here, Order. comes in here, comes Order. in here. Order. Well, just, Order. Oh, Senator Lord. Cash, uh, Minister, oh, please resume Senator, your seat. Minister, Senator Cash, I had just called the chamber to order. Thank you. Minister, please continue. Thank, thank you, President. Sen Senator Rustin, uh, it would be useful if those of you on that side who actually believed in the net zero commitment you made to South Australia come you, in Minister. here and tell the us how you would get to it. The answering has expired. Senator Rustin, first supplementary. In all of the electorates. Um, Thank you, President. My uh, second question to the minister um, it would be keen to understand um, if you could advise the Senate on how many sites under the improving mobile coverage round of the Mobile Black Spots program are in Labor held seats. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. That, that is, well, if I'm repping the PM, certainly I'll take that on notice. I think from memory uh, that would be in the uh, communications portfolio, so that should have been asked of the appropriate minister. But I, I'm happy to return now. I'm happy to return now to community batteries. The community batteries for household solar program will maximise the benefits for Australia's real rooftop solar transformation, supporting the grid and providing shared storage for up to 10,000 households. The first 48 community batteries, which were announced publicly as election commitments, will be delivered by the business grant hubs. The remaining 342 batteries with unspecified locations will be delivered by ARENA with applications to open later this year. Uh, I, I, I would I, 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 I hesitate to take that interjection from Senator Watt. So <clears throat> uh, I think from that, Senator Rustin, you would see that yes, there are 48 which were announced as election commitments. There are also 342 which are, uh, as I am advised, you, Minister, subject the time to. Thank you, Minister. answering has uh, expired. Senator Rustin, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, on the 29th of July last year, your finance minister. Uh, tweeted, taxpayer money must be spent in the best interests of the community, not in an election outcome. Isn't this statement, along with countless others that have been made by your leader and other Labor ministers, 
a case of complete hypocrisy when the answer to the two previous questions is three out of every four recipients in the solar battery program or the mobile black spot program are miraculously in Labor seats. Oh, no. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. That, that is incorrect. Senator Rustin, the assertion in the question, I, I, I'm addressing your question. Minister, please direct oh, your comments sorry, to through, the Sorry, through the chair. Senator Rustin is uh, uh, being very loose with the truth in her, uh, her question because I told her, I told her 48 batteries announces election commitments, the remaining 342 to be delivered by ARENA with applications to open later this year. So, you know, this is the problem with draft drafting a final SUP without listening to the question. Uh, Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Cash. In chair, point of order in relation to the minister should be directing her comments, as you stated, through the chair and not pointing directly at Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Senator Cash, and I will remind the minister to direct her comments to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to address you, President, but I am somewhat amused at Senator Cash, who is well known for the, a lot of pointing in this chamber, telling me about pointing. But if, if, it would, if, if Senator Rustin wishes me to speak to you, I will. And the policy point I am making, Senator Cash, I'll take that interjection. The policy point I will make is that I have told you that the numbers that you have asserted are incorrect, but you persist in putting uh, misinformation before the, before, in front of the Senate because uh, you uh, want to make a political point. Well, it's not founded in fact. Has expired. Order. And I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the uh, President's Gallery of the Australian Political Exchange's 24th delegation from the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, particular, and in particular to the Senate. Senator Payman. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Wong. In the last hour, the Senate has agreed to the government's safeguard mechanisms legislation, which is another landmark in the Albanese uh, government's proactive approach to take action on climate change. Minister, how are the Albanese government safeguard reforms a step forward for the nation's action on climate change? Minister Wong. Uh, well, I thank Senator Payman for her question, and I thank all of my colleagues on this side, uh, the Greens and members of the crossbench, who supported uh, this historic legislation. And one of the things that those opposite, and I know they are fools returning to their folly over and over again, uh, one of the things that those opposite uh, seem not to have understood is the Australian people at the last election returned a parliament, not just a government, but a parliament uh, supportive of action on climate change. And those opposite are still stuck in the fights of years past. And in fact, uh, I, I listened to some of the debate which Senator McAllister had so extraordinarily well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, you know, I, I remember this. I remember Senator Joyce. Uh, standing down there asking the same questions. Uh, uh, you know, I remember uh, Senator, uh, the then Senator Macdonald. Uh, I remember a whole range of those. Senator Minchin, who said that climate change was a left-wing conspiracy to deindustrialise the Western world. I mean, these people have, 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 they have not changed. They have not changed. And what I'd say to those opposite is this. I'd say two things. The first is this legislation is one part, not the only part, but an critical and important part of ensuring Australia can thrive and prosper in a world where the world is moving to net zero by 2050. And Senator Canavan, despite your best efforts, and I know you're not going to be worried about me talking at you, Senator Canavan, despite your best efforts, despite your best efforts, uh, the coalition did oh. sign up. Oh. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Um, I ask you to draw the minister to preface her comments through the chair. It's not about whether Senator Canavan uh, minds Senator or not. McKenzie. It's actually the standing orders, and it's about being Senator respectful McKenzie. to the chair. Senator McKenzie, when you call a point of order, and I have reminded senators of this earlier in the week, please 
state your point of order without making a statement. I will remind the minister to direct her comments to the chair, minister. It's everybody, nobody wants to have fun anymore. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Matter, uh, President, uh, as Senator Canavan, no matter how much Senator Canavan tried, those in his party still uh, signed up to net zero by 2050. At least that's what they told the Australian people. Uh, at least that's what they told the Australian people. But you know what? They have no plan to deliver it. They're not even interested in Thank a plan. Thank you, Minister. To the time for answering has expired. Senator Payman, first supplementary. Thank uh, Senator Payman, please resume your seat. There's too much disorder in the chamber and noise. Senator Payman, please continue. Thank you, President. After a decade of policy delay, denial and dysfunction, how will these reforms deliver overdue policy certainty? What has been the response to the parliaments progressing these reforms? Minister. Uh, I thank the senator uh, for her question, and it's a question that goes to the heart of why this reform is needed. It goes to the heart of why this reform is good, not only uh, for uh, action on climate, but also for the Australian economy and for Australian, Australian business. And one of the, the irrationalities from those opposite has been that they have misunderstood for over uh, 15 years uh, the importance of certainty in markets, uh, and that fact. The 22 energy policies that they put in place, which ensured there was no investment certainty and that the private sector would not invest in accordance uh, with its desires much of the time, which is why we have this bizarre situation where most of the business community uh, is not where the coalition are. Now, that really must be hard for the party that thinks they're the party of business. Uh, and, and, and what I've noticed in some of the debate uh, uh, through you, President. What I've noticed in some of the debate is they seem to say that somehow uh, it's because you, Minister, business don't time understand. It be has expired. <laughs> Senator Payman, second supplementary. Um, the Minister for Climate Change and Energy has said that these reforms aren't just a plan for the climate, they are a plan for the economy. Minister, what will these reforms mean for investment and the economy? Minister. I pick up where I, get, where I, where I left off, um, President. Uh, the, the reality is the investor community, the business community, is well, away, well ahead of those opposite. Well ahead of those, those opposite. And it says something about the delusion uh, of a party that goes to an election saying, we had 22 policies, but actually we're up to it for 2050. Uh, we, we had no investment certainty, so there was no investment in the energy sector. But guess what? We now, after the election, we know better than all of the investor community, all of the business representatives, all of the businesses in this country who are seeking certainty from the parliament and from the government. And can I say what an abrogation of responsibility it has been that a party of government has left it, left it uh, to the crossbench and the Greens, and we welcome their support. But what does it say about you? What does it say about you as a party of government that says we support 2050, the no uh, thank election, you, you're nowhere? Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Order. Order. I also draw to Senator's attention the um, members of the engagement referendum working group who are in the visitors' gallery. Um, Senator Nampajinka Price. Oh, how appropriate. Um, thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Minister, can you please outline to the Senate what mechanism the Labor Party intends to use for determining a person's Aboriginality for the purposes of voting for uh, or serving on the proposed voice to parliament body. Uh, Minister Wong. Um, can I first acknowledge uh, the leaders in the chamber? Uh, and uh, Senator Rennick. I would have hoped, Senator Rennick, that regardless of your views about the voice, you might acknowledge leadership and respect leadership uh, and say to those leaders of First Nations who are here, uh, we, we have appreciated the leadership you have shown with your peoples uh, and in engagement with um, the government, the with the parliament, with the cabinet and with the prime minister. Uh, and it has been, I think, uh, a very important and frankly very moving process uh, of working through these issues uh, to get to the point we are, we are today. Um, Senator Price, I, I'm frankly quite disappointed in that question. Um, Minister, please resume your seat. 
Uh, Senator Cash, I have a senator on her feet. Senator Nampajinka Price. Thank you. I'd just like to uh, correct the senator that my appropriate title is Senator Nambajinba Price. Thank you, Senator. Minister. I apologise, Senator Nampajinka Price. Uh, um, I am disappointed in the question. Uh, it's a question uh, that I've heard in, uh, from those who, who seek to undermine uh, indigeneity. Um, and I, I'm not suggesting. Order! 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 Uh, but I accept you wish to put that to me, and I will answer it. Um, the, uh, I'm advised that there is a three-part uh, test, which is widely accepted and has not changed. I'm advised that the Australian government generally applies the following common law criteria for the Senator purpose McCarthy. of determining eligibility for First Nations-specific service, services, uh, and they are that a person is Aboriginal and or, tor or of Torres Strait Islander descent, uh, identifies as an Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander and is accepted as such by the community in which they live or have previously lived. I am advised this is a widely accepted test by government agencies, by First Nations organisations and community organisations, uh, and if I may say, it would appear to be common sense. Thank you, Minister. Senator Nampajinka Price, first supplementary. Thank you. Um, Will, can you please, Senator, please confirm with me, will the Albanese government follow at all the example of the South Australian government and allow people to simply make a statutory declaration of their own Aboriginality? Thank you, Senator. Minister Wong. Um, th thank you, uh, President. Uh, uh, and in, in response, I, I'd make the point that I, I, I think I have responded in... Uh, Senator Rustin. Order. Order. It is disrespectful to keep calling out across the chamber, especially when the minister is on her feet answering. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you, um, President. Uh, I, I refer to my previous answer, which I think goes to these issues, but the senator raises what has occurred in South Australia. Uh, and uh, in South Australia, there has been, and um, uh, Thomas Mayer and, and others who are involved, uh, and, uh, and others who are involved in South Australia um, would, would attest to the importance of the announcement on Sunday, uh, which, uh, in which I think there was bipartisan support from memory. Is that right? Um, for for uh, and I should to Aegis is here. Thank you for your, your work too. Um, uh, it points to the, the sort of unity across the community. The unity across the community uh, that um, uh, this Minister, process, when done well, has expired. Uh, can... Senator Nampajinka Price, second supplementary. Thank you. Is the Albanese government concerned about people taking advantage of the criteria for establishing Aboriginality? And will they consider strict requirements for those who wish to vote or serve on the voice? Thank you, Senator Nampajinka Price, Minister. Again, I've, I've answered. Uh, the broad, I've answered the. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin, I called you uh, during the last question. I'm going to call you again. You are being disorderly and disrespectful. Minister, please continue. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I've answered the approach the government takes as a matter of course in the response to the first question, but I would make this point. Uh, that the proposed wording of the constitutional change makes it clear, uh, uh, amongst other things, that the structure and process associated with the voice uh, and its composition would be uh, the subject of the determination by the parliament. Uh, so obviously, uh, were the Australian people uh, to agree to uh, support the constitutional change that has been proposed, uh, members and senators will have engagement on some of those issues, including the issues uh, that Senator Nampajin for Price ra raises today. Thank you, Minister. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thank you, President. My question is to Minister Wong in her capacity representing the Prime Minister. Minister, I'm asking this question on behalf of millions of Australians, but also Julian Assange's father, John Shipton, who went to San Diego in mid-March hoping to hear that his son would be released. Did the Prime Minister raise the ongoing prosecution and detention of Julian Assange with President Biden during their meeting on 14 March this year? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister. 
thank you, uh, uh, and thank you to Senator Sir Shoebridge for his uh, question. Uh, I'd make a few points about Mr. Assange. Uh, um, there is, I understand that there is strong interest in the case. There is a depth of community sentiment, and we have made clear publicly uh, before the election and since that the government's view is that Mr. Assange's case has dragged on too long and should be brought to a close. Um, it is not generally my practice to give chapter and verse of everything that is said in every diplomatic communications, but in the interest of transparency on this issue, I have said uh, that I have personally expressed this view. Uh, the view that is that Mr Assange's case has dragged on long enough and should be brought to a close to the governments of the United States and the government of the United Kingdom, and I will continue to do so. so, so the, the Prime Minister has also made clear in the parliament, and I'd refer you to his answers, uh, that he has raised this case uh, at the appropriate levels. What I would say is this, and you would know this, Senator Shoebridge, as a lawyer. Uh, we are not able, as an Australian government, to intervene in another country's legal or court processes. That, that, well, it is true. It is true, and you know that you would Order. understand. I've, well, Senator Senator Shoebridge, there is a thing called the rule of law. There is there is a principle called the separation of powers. Well, Order. And no amount of bellowing at me from the from that end of the chamber is going to change the fact that a court has to determine the legal process. So we can raise these issues as I have and as the Prime Minister have, uh, but we are not able uh, to alter the judicial processes of another country. Order. <laughs> Minister Wong, please, please resume your seat, Senator Wong. Senator Wish Wilson, those comments are disrespectful and disorderly, and I ask you not to call out. Senator Shoebridge. Thank you, President. Oh, uh, sorry, I thought you were on a point of order. Uh, thank you. Senator Wish Wilson, uh, how would you propose that we do that? Send the Australian Army into a court? I mean, really? Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson? Uh, I, seeing as I was asked a direct uh, Senator question. Senator Wish Wilson, please I'll, resume I, your I seat. I can respond. Senator Wish Wilson, please resume your seat. Senator Shoebridge, first supplementary. Um, thank you, President. Uh, Minister, the Prime Minister has said, and I think you have too, enough is enough. And the Prime Minister said he wants a resolution of this matter, but this, to use his words, requires quiet diplomacy. How could a conversation between President Biden, PM Albanese and PM Sunak, which he was in just two weeks ago, not be the most important kind of quiet diplomacy to use to free Julian Assange? And why wasn't it used? Uh, thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister Wong. Uh, uh, that isn't what I said, and you've made a set of assertions there uh, which may or may not be true. And I would again say uh, that we have, at the Prime Minister's level and uh, at Foreign Minister level, uh, been very clear uh, in our views that this matter has dragged on too long and it should be brought to a close. Uh, but I again make the point that there is a legal process uh, which is um, you know, in accordance with uh, the tradition of the separation of powers, which I regard as uh, an important part of democracy. Uh, uh, it is not something that the Australian government can Order. resolve. Having said that, it is, it is appropriate. Um, it's it's Minister Wong. Senator Wish Wilson, I called you to order twice. I expect you to come to order. Minister, did you wish to continue? Uh, uh, what we are doing what we can between government and government, uh, but there are limits to what that diplomacy can achieve. Thank you, Minister. The time until for answering I've, has expired. I'll... Senator Shoebridge, second supplementary. Thank you, President. It is a simple question, Minister, that Julian Assange's family are asking, and as Australian citizens, they deserve an answer to. Did their Prime Minister ask President Biden to drop the United States prosecution and allow Julian to come home when they met just a few short weeks ago? Please answer the question. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, the, the Prime Minister has made his views clear about this matter having been brought to, to uh, dragged on too long, but I, I again would make this point 
I would make this point uh, that whilst we are doing what we can between government and government, there are limits until Mr Assange has concluded the legal processes. Uh, and uh, I think on no, it is that there are legal processes which are still on foot. Well, Order, which cannot... Senator Rice. And, and I'd, Order. I'd also... Um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Shoebridge. Um, thank you, President. My point of order is relevance. My question was about a meeting between the President and the Prime Minister. Not about court proceedings, but about a meeting between the President and the Prime Minister. And the, minister, uh, and the minister is refusing to address it. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. I believe the minister is being relevant to your question, Minister. I did respond to it, and I'm actually trying to be helpful. And if you perhaps listened to what I'm saying, Senator Shoebridge, what I'm saying to you is that whilstsoever there are legal proceedings on foot, it is very difficult for there to be resolution between governments. I think that is an observation of fact. Uh, well, uh, uh, minister, yeah, there are some, there minister, are some countries. Minister, some, some, please some... resume your seat. Senator Shoebridge, this is not a debate. Senator Shoebridge, order. Senator Shoebridge, Senator Shoebridge, order on my left and my right. I've called you to order. This is not an opportunity to debate. There are other opportunities during our sitting for you to make whatever comments you want. You ask the question and you listen with respect. Thank you, Minister. Thank, thank you. I would also make the point, because Senator, uh, the Senator mentioned Mr Assange's family, I have engaged with his family. Thank you, uh, Minister Wong. Senator Stirl. Thank you, President. I've got a ripper for the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. After a decade of inaction of climate, thanks to those opposite, the Albanese government is taking decisive action to combat challenges of climate change. The passage of the safeguard mechanism legislation delivers landmark reforms that will result in the reduction of 205 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions to 2030. Minister, why does Australian agriculture support action on climate change? Minister Watt. Thank you, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Stirl. It, it's really nice to get a question about agriculture. I'm, I've had questions from Senator Stirl, Senator Coney, <laughs> Senator Watt, all sorts of senators over here, but never get a question from the National Party about agriculture. It seems that they've given up. Well, due to the Senate's efforts today, Australia is one step closer to reaching net zero by 2050, not just towards meeting the target, but to ensuring our economy is geared up to take advantage of the opportunities that will come with it. The safeguard mechanism reforms passed by the Senate today will deliver 205 million tonnes of emissions reduction by 2030. So after 10 long years and a couple more days of delay and dysfunction, Australia now has sensible reforms to ensure Australia's largest emitters reduce their emissions while Order. remaining competitive in a decarbonising global economy. We know Senator Canavan and his mates will never accept reality. We know they'll never open their eyes to what is happening around the world. But the rest of the world is moving on. I'm telling you, it's moving on. And that, and that is fantastic news for farmers. Uh, and along with everyone else in our agriculture, fisheries and forestry sectors. Because the truth is, as much as the former country party used to recognise, our farmers are on the front line of climate change in this country. Whether it's repeated flooding, more intense fires, more severe cyclones, Order. larger hail or more, more prolonged drought, the impacts of climate-induced disasters are hitting our farms and their bottom line, driving up the price of fruit and veggies for consumers. In fact, we know uh, from ABARES modelling that climate change has reduced annual average farm profits by 23 per cent, or around $29,000 per farm, due to seasonal weather changes over the last 20 years. It is well beyond time for this country to take action, and we're not telling the ag industry something they don't already agree with. Whether it's the National Farmers Federation, the Meat and Livestock Association, Dairy Australia, the Red Meat Advisory Council, they've all moved on, and one of these days the National Order. Party Thank might you, too. Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Searle, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. The Australian people, businesses and farmers, have long been calling for action on climate change. What opportunities will the Albanese government's strong action on climate change create for Australian farmers, Minister? Minister Watt. Thanks again, Senator Stirl. I think you've asked five times as many questions about agriculture that the National Party have since the election, but you know that's, that's just the kind of guy you are. 
The latest ABARES figures show that on the back of good conditions for the past few seasons, farm incomes are at record highs. Order. And while obviously this isn't the case for everyone, on the whole it is a good time to be in the agriculture sector. But imagine how high those incomes could have been if action was taken on climate change 20 years ago, not today. And as I say, we know what difference it would have made. ABARES tells us uh, that farm incomes have suffer uh, suffered by 23 per cent due to seasonal climate weather, uh, and weather conditions. Uh, and we also know that climate change presents an ongoing risk. Uh, to farmers, especially given the inevitability that drought is around the corner. And that's why having a diversified income is vital for our nation's farmers, and increased activity in the carbon market will provide that opportunity, along with the activity in the nature repair market, which will be able to happen now that Labor has introduced Thank legislation you, to make Time it happen. Thank you, Minister. has expired. Senator Stirl, second supplement. Thank you, President. Under the previous government, climate inaction was a deliberate policy choice, and as a result we saw increases in emissions. What risk do farmers face if we do not take action on climate change? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you again, Senator Stirl. Of course, there are long-term natural impacts that come with not addressing climate change, and I see them almost every day in my role as Emergency Management Minister. In fact, uh, of course, I was recently in the Gulf of Carpentaria after the floods there, and there were more media reports this morning suggesting that early estimates from Gulf flooding uh, are that tens of thousands of head of cattle could have perished. And these are the events we will see more often if we don't take action on climate change. But it's not just those economic and environmental, em, environmental impacts that farmers face as a result of climate change. Uh, it is crucial to our position as a trusted trading partner around the globe that we continue to increase our sustainability effort. Who could forget those embarrassing images of former Prime Minister Scott Morrison giving an empty speech to an empty room at COP26 in Glasgow? Anyone who knows anything about agriculture and trade knows uh, that we need to take more action on climate change uh, to shore up those international Thank markets, you, and I'm surprised the National Party doesn't get it. Has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Senator Watt. With a $240 million proposed to be spent by your government for the Hobart Stadium, you could lift rent assistance for nearly 40,000 Tasmanians by 40 per cent. If those 40,000 people were meeting with you this week, like the stadium lobbyists were, what do you think they'd want you to do? Thank you, uh, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Watt. Thanks, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Tyrrell. I think Senator Tyrrell, despite the very few number of questions you have the opportunity to ask, I think you've asked me more questions than the National Party has since the election as well. Uh, and it's also always a pleasure uh, to answer your questions. Um, Senator Tyrrell, obviously the issue around the Hobart Stadium has been a matter of some uh, debate within the Tasmanian community. And having spent some time in Tasmania, I know that there are very strong views about this on both sides of the debate. Uh, our government is working with the Tasmanian government around this proposal. Uh, of course, the Tasmanian government, I think on the whole, are, are strongly supportive of it, but we're very conscious uh, that there are a range of views uh, on this topic. Um, but, Senator Tyrrell, I guess what I'd put to you is that um, wherever we end up on the issue of the Hobart Stadium, it doesn't mean that we can't also be taking action when it comes to rental affordability uh, and the housing pressures that Tasmanians are undoubtedly under. Uh, the, I can take you through some of what we're doing about, about rental affordability, Order. but in the end, the answer to rental stress is a sustained boost to the supply of homes to rent. Uh, and a substantial investment in new and affordable houses. Uh, and Senator Tyrrell, you won't be surprised to hear me say then that the best thing the Senate can do is back the Housing Australia Future Fund. Uh, I'm, I'm actually not across, Senator Tyrrell, what your position is on, on that issue, uh, but I certainly know what some other Tasmanians who you're sitting right near over there, what their view is on it. Hello, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, and it'd be a really good thing if Senator Wish Wilson, Order. Senator McKim, uh, and every other Tasmanian senator joined with the government to back the Housing Australia Future Fund so that we can have that investment uh, in affordable housing, in social housing, in housing Order. for veterans, Order. in housing for domestic violence victims uh, in Tasmania and in every other part of the country. It is odd that we have the Greens and the Coalition joining together as the new coalition in Australia uh, to you, block affordable housing thank investment. You, Watt. Um, order. Order. Senators Brown and Daniam. Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Thank you, President. 
So the Hobart Stadium's own business case says the project will lose two dollars for every dollar it makes. When the project itself is telling you it's going to lose all of your money twice over, and you think that represents good value, what's your argument against raising the rate of job seeker? Uh, Senator, uh, Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President, and thanks again, Senator Tyrrell. Uh, I probably can't add a huge amount to my previous answer in terms of the uh, Hobart Stadium. Uh, as I say, it is something that our government is in negotiation with both the AFL and the Tasmanian government on, and I'm sure that in due course uh, our position will be finalised and, and then determined. Uh, but again, uh, Senator Tyrrell, uh, I do know how we can assist Order. Tasmanians who are doing it tough uh, through uh, the affordable housing crisis that is undoubtedly the case across the country and including in your state. Uh, and I know, Senator Tyrrell, that, um, that you are a strong supporter of greater investment in social and affordable housing, uh, and that's something that we would, of course, like to continue working with you on. Uh, all I can do is say that the best solution uh, that we have before us is a policy that the government took to the election to create this Housing Australia Future Fund and can get going as soon as the Senate passes it to build Thank that you, housing. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Tyrrell, second supplement. Thank you, President. Budgets are about priorities. You could build 2,900 homes in Tasmania with the funding slated for the government spend on the Hobart Stadium. This would be enough to give every single homeless Tasmanian a place to call home. What's your government's priority? Put in a roof on a stadium that retracts, by the way, or put in a roof over their heads? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Tyrrell, again. Well, of course, any, any budget that the federal government brings down uh, undertakes and provides funding for a broad range of activities. And I'm very confident uh, that when this budget is finalised, and I know Senator Gallagher in particular has been putting a huge effort into framing it, it will deal with a number of really important challenges that Australians are facing, whether it be in Tasmania or elsewhere around the country. Uh, of course, assisting people with cost of living relief will Order. be a real centrepiece of this budget, uh, and, and uh, providing more investment in housing will be as well, provided we can get that legislation passed. Uh, now, Senator Tyrrell, um, I think I'm, I'm sure you're aware, but we are already taking action on, on affordable housing in Tasmania. 48 new affordable homes being provided in Launceston in partnership with uh, Community Housing Limited, 181 new homes in North West Tasmania funded by the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. Uh, so there's a lot of action happening. We know there needs Thank to be you, more, Minister, and that's what that housing plan is about. Has expired. Senator Birmingham. President, uh, President, my question is to the Minister for Trade, Senator Farrell. Inpex is one of the most important foreign investors in Australia. Shortly before question time today, INPEX's global CEO, Takeyuki Oida, spoke at an event hosted by Resources Minister Madeleine King. Oida-san said in his speech, and I quote, about the government's gas market policies that, we are concerned that market intervention will only compound the situation of price challenges. Price intervention is likely to discourage investment in exploration and production, while simultaneously driving up demand. The energy policy environment in Australia today appears to be driven almost by ideology and domestic concerns that the investment climate in Australia appears to be deteriorating. I ask Senator Farrell, as the minister responsible for investment, how much does the government believe its interventions will reduce investment in Australia, and does the Albanese Labor government accept responsibility for the deterioration uh, in minister. Australia's that investment reputation? Asking, that time for asking has expired. Minister Farrell. Uh, zero. Um, zero is the. Uh, zero no, no, zero, zero impact on our um, uh, relations, relations with. Uh, yeah, zero. Yeah, zero. There, seriously, zero. Zero is the answer. It won't have any impact on our um, uh, international reputation or our reliability or our stability as a supplier of amongst other things, uh, gas. Um, I've, uh, I've followed the, <coughs> I followed the, impacts, uh, the impact story in Australia very closely for a, a long period of time since my great friend, <coughs> um, Mr Paul Henderson, uh, shook hands with uh, Mr Kita Mura all those years ago to start the process of building one of the great, Japanese, ja yeah. great Japanese investments 
uh, in this uh, country to sit to sit and watch to sit and watch those uh, uh, gas ships uh, uh, go out of uh, Darwin Harbour uh, on their way to supplying something like 10 per cent of Japan's uh, gas needs um, is, a, is a wonderful sight, and I can recommend it to uh, to anybody. Um, I met uh, with the gentleman that uh, you you referred to, and I've met with Mr. Kitamura. In fact, I had Order. the privilege. I had the privilege uh, late, yeah, late last year of awarding Mr. Kitamura uh, an Order of Australia at the uh, the uh, Australian Embassy uh, in uh, in uh, in Tokyo. Um, we're a, we're a democracy. We're a democracy just like Japan, and companies in Japan can express points of view that don't always agree with the, with the, uh, uh, with, with the government of the day, or in fact uh, other business. Uh, Thank you, Minister. Business. The time for answering has expired. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Oida San also said that quote Australia is competing for global investment, and the changes we are seeing to Australian policy settings will choke investment and strangle the expansion of LNG projects in this country. The consequences of these well-intentioned policies will be the increasing energy demand in our region will be met by coal and not by natural gas. Senator Farrell, will Labor's gas market intervention increase demand for coal and, as Oida Sands says, make net zero by 2050 an impossible task? Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator uh, Birmingham. No. Uh, is the answer to that uh, no is the answer to that question um, we are making sensible decisions in the interests of Australian yeah. consumers now now after 10 years of doing nothing about these sorts of issues you left you left the electricity system in a complete uh, Minister mess Minister Farrell please resume your seat order on my left calling out shouting out is disorderly and I'd ask you to stop uh, Minister, please continue. President, and Senator Canavan knows what I'm saying is exactly correct. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Farrell. Um, Senator McKenzie. Uh, point of order, Chair. Going to Odger's explanation to the rules of debate around Standing Order 193, ministers are to direct their uh, comments through the chair, and Senator. Farrell was yelling and pointing at Senator Canavan rather than respectfully answering uh, the question you, through you. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Let me first of all remind all senators that shouting out across the chamber, Senator Canavan, Senator Canavan, shouting out across the chamber is incredibly disorderly. That's the first point I'd make. The second point I'd make is that Senator Farrell was directing his comments to me, except for a slight deviation, and I will remind him, I will remind him to direct his comments to the chair, but I'd also remind other senators not to keep calling out to a minister on their feet who's answering a question. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and thank you for that protection from uh, Senator uh, Canavan. Um, look, we were left with a situation where um, the potential was that, as a result of those 10 years of neglect in the electricity sector, sector by the former government— uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. Point of order on direct relevance. The question actually related to the gas market interventions, and particularly the question went to the observation by one of the largest foreign investors in this country as to whether those interventions would increase demand for coal. I ask you to draw the minister to the question. Uh, Senator Birmingham, the minister answered the question when he first stood. That's my understanding. He has answered your question directly. Minister Farrell. Thank, thank, thank you, uh, President. And th my first comment was a direct answer to the question. And I don't, with all due respect to um, uh, Impex, I don't agree with their assessment of the situation. Now, Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Rita San also said, quote, on the geopolitical front, Australia's quiet quitting of the LNG business has potentially very sinister consequences. The question of who will replace Australian supply in the market is front and centre. Alarmingly, the inconvenient truth is most likely 
that Russia, China and Iran will fill the void. End quote. Will Labor's interventions create new market opportunities for Russia, China and Iran? And why should Australians take the word of Senator Farrell ahead of one of our largest foreign investors and experts uh, in this Minister. field? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Your time has expired. Minister Farrell. Well, <coughs> Senator... Senator Ciccone. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. I'm going to wait for silence. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, uh, and thank Senator Birmingham for his question. Well, you, you can uh, rely on my word. I'm a minister, minister in a uh, fantastic Labor government, and we are all about providing a stable political environment in which to continue to supply reliably uh, Japan uh, gas, uh, gas supplies. Uh, in the case of Impex, that's um, well. Look, in all due respect, I had a very long meeting with the gentleman that you're, you're talking about before uh, that lunch. Uh, it was an extremely a a amicable uh, meeting, at which, at, which, at, which, at, at which I made it very clear that this country continues to be a stable, reliable supplier of gas into the uh, Japanese uh, market. Of course, Japan is not the only place we're supplying gas. Thank you, uh, gas Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Babette. Thank you, President. Um, my question is for the Minister representing the Treasurer, Minister Gallagher. Minister Gallagher, we meet again. Your October 2022 budget included a figure of $77 million that was in the Services Australia Portfolio Budget Statement. This figure is the allowance for the COVID-19 vaccine claim scheme payouts for 2022-2023. At that time, at the time, this represented an 80-fold increase in allocation from the previous federal budget of just 937,000. My office is contacted every single day by people who in good faith trusted their government but are now paying for this decision with injury. They are suffering and some in this place mock them to this day. Can you please update the Senate on the total amount that has been paid out by the COVID-19 vaccine claim scheme this current financial year? Please. Thank you, Senator Babbitt. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Babbitt for the question and for um, his advice um, ahead of time that he was going to answer, ask a question on this. It, it greatly assists him being able to provide the information that uh, the Senator is, is seeking. Uh, as the Senator outlined, the COVID-19 vaccine claims assist, uh, scheme was put in place uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, and after the announcement of uh, the approval of uh, the vaccines and the vaccine um, program across Australia. The scheme uh, was established as a fit-for-purpose, time-limited scheme claim scheme to respond to the unprecedented circumstances of COVID-19. It was designed to ensure that people who have suffered a recognised adverse event as a direct result of the vaccine, COVID vaccine that is, have faster access to compensation than a costly and complex court process. Uh, it is for, uh, there are seven recognised clinical conditions which are eligible under the scheme, uh, which I can go through, but in, in specifically in relation to Senator Babbitt's question, it's right there was a provision of um, $77 million uh, made um, total expenditure as of the 28th of March 2023 is in the order of 7.2 million dollars. That uh, Services Australia, who administer the scheme, has received 3,374 claims under the scheme, and as uh, at the moment, 126 claims have been approved for that total figure of just around 7.2 million. Thank you, Minister. Senator Babette, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Now, the TGA's most recent report shows that they've received 137,970 reported adverse events following COVID vaccination. That's the equivalent of two and a half packed Marvel sports stadiums in Melbourne, big stadium. It appears that, that the number of claims will continue to grow. Minister, uh, what amounts will your government be allocating to this scheme in the next budget, in the upcoming thank, budget? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, uh, President. I thank Senator Babette for the supplementary. Um, 
My, my understanding of the TGA's uh, adverse events report is that they report against a range of um, possible um, so, you know, serious side effects, from lesser serious to more serious, uh, as listed under the adverse events, and not all of those would necessarily be eligible for a claim through this scheme. But in the event uh, that um, there was increased demand, it is a demand-driven scheme. Um, that is, you can make certain provisions, but if there were, um, you know, we would meet the costs of the applications, the successful applications that met the terms of the scheme and those seven conditions, the seven recognised clinical t conditions which are eligible under the scheme. So it isn't really a question of whether we have enough money. It's a demand-driven scheme, and those that compensation would be paid. Thank you, Minister. Senator Babet, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. So obviously we've paid billions to pharmaceutical companies, and in return. Australians have been slogged with a huge compensation bill to pay for uh, vax injured people. What options does the government have to make these companies responsible and pay for the, in pay for the injuries that they created with a crappy product? Thank you, Senator Babette, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Babbitt, for the supplementary. Well, I don't agree um, with the characterisation of the COVID-19 as a crappy product. Um, it has successfully vaccinated um, millions and millions of Australians and significantly uh, decreased the chance of serious disease, uh, particularly on vulnerable um, individuals. So I don't accept that. Uh, as to the commercial arrangements with the pharmaceutical companies, I think if people remember at the time because the vaccine was developed in a relatively short period compared to others, um, there were commercial discussions about how to manage um, schemes and claims like this, uh, but I can't go into those details. They are commercial in confidence. Senator Babette, second supplementary. Oh, done that. Sorry. Uh, Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for, Woman, for Women, Senator Gallagher. Earlier today, the government's workplace gender equality amendment closing the gender pay gap bill was passed with wide support across our parliament. Can the minister update the parliament on how the government is advancing women's economic equality? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. Thanks, uh, thank uh, Senator Smith for uh, the question and again for all the work she does in relation to um, uh, gender equality um, and ah, women's ah. policy in general. I really do appreciate it. It's so fantastic to work with such a, a great bunch of people um, and have such a great bunch of women across the Labor caucus. Um, and this, this, um, this piece of legislation, which I accept and, and, in fact, I thank everybody in this chamber because this is a piece of legislation where the chamber came together as one and agreed uh, that this should be a priority to get this bill passed. Uh, it's passed the House of Representatives now and, again, it was work that was built upon by um, the former government, um, those opposite who had uh, started the review and agreed to the recommendations. So it is really good at the end of a long and at sometimes scratchy sitting fortnight to, uh, to be in a position where we have and can demonstrate to the women of Australia that the parliament has agreed that ending or accelerating um, action on the gender pay gap is such a critical and important national reform. The bill that passed the House this morning uh, is going to change things. It is going to ensure that at a business level um, where there, a gender pay gap exists, that that will be reported and people will be able to see that. It's important from a transparency and accountability um, reason, but it's also about driving the reform that's needed to close the gender pay gap. There is absolutely no reason why uh, men and women uh, performing the work, the jobs that they do in, in, simil in businesses should be paid uh, differently uh, for the same type of work. And we know that this has an, a huge impact on gender equality and women's economic uh, independence or women's economic equality as well. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. While this was, bill was being debated, both in the House and in the, and the Senate, many of us observed that there was more work to do. Can the Minister provide an update on the government's plans to continue to improve gender equality? Thank you, Senator Smith, Minister. 
Uh, thank you, and thanks, Senator Smith, uh, for the supplementary. Well, there is more work to do, and we are, as a government, committed to getting on with that. As a government, uh, from the, our early days with the Jobs and Skills Summit and the platform that we took uh, to the election campaign, made clear that women's uh, economic equality, women's, uh, and the issue of gender equality was going to be a priority for this government. We recognised that in October, with our investments. Uh, that we made in, in social programs like early education and care to ensure that women can work the hours they want to work, uh, but also um, through the work we are doing now in progressing the work on a national strategy to achieve gender equality. And I would encourage everyone to get involved in that. We are wanting to hear from women from right, right across the country and all of our, the people we represent. Consultations are open. Um, to have those conversations in your communities uh, with your neighbours, your families and friends about how we can make Australia a leader in the relation to Thank gender you, equality. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister outline how we can all contribute to improving gender equality? Thank you, Senator Smith, Minister. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Smith for the supplementary. Well, Senator Smith is right. We all have a role to play in this place, in our communities, at home, in businesses, unions, schools, universities, churches, sporting groups. Uh, wherever you are, we can work together and make women's uh, economic equality and gender equality will make us a better country. In this place, we can help drive that change by getting around the table, working together, as we've done on the bill that passed the parliament today. We know that there's a lot more work to do. Uh, we've been delivering um, some of those important um, additions or investments into driving this change through cheaper childcare, through 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave, boosting paid parental leave, through our gender responsive budgeting and in the first budget in nearly a decade that casts a gender lens over the budget. We've got the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children, a wage increase for aged care workers where 96 per cent of them are women. National Women's Health Thank Advisory you, Council. Senator I could go on, President, but my expired. Thank you. Senator Cash. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Uh, last week, in your absence, Minister Farrell was asked to name anywhere in Australia where electricity prices had gone down since the Albanese government was elected. Minister Farrell did not name anywhere, but did say, I don't follow electricity prices closely enough to be able to answer that question. Minister Wong, do you follow electricity prices more closely than Minister Farrell? You wouldn't have said that. Uh, Minister. Uh, Are you more in touch than Minister? Order. <laughs> Uh, I always think it's uh, a very dangerous thing when I take the interdiction from Senator Birmingham when politicians tried to uh, compete about these things. But what I would about being in touch that is because we're all politicians, aren't we? But uh, I think we understand very acutely the cost of living pressures facing Australian families. And uh, Senator Rustin. We understand very acutely the cost of living pressures facing Australian families. Uh, uh, obviously, inflation has driven, uh, for a whole range of reasons, has di driven increases in costs. People are feeling it uh, at the supermarket, and they're feeling it uh, in, in terms of utilities and services. Uh, and that is why, well, you know, uh, that is why uh, those of us on this side. Uh, along with the Australian Greens and others, voted, voted uh, for price relief uh, uh, for Australian families. So every time someone from the, the, the other side comes in here and tells us about energy price relief, let's remember they voted against energy price relief. That is what the coalition did. You voted against a price cap for coal and gas. You voted against uh, uh, a, a but three billion in targeted bill relief for businesses and households most in need. You voted against a 12-month price cap on uncontracted gas at $12 a gigajoule, and a 12-month price ceiling on domestic coal for New South Wales and Queensland. And then you have the gall to come in here and talk about who's out of touch. Well, no one who was in touch with Australian families and what is happening on cost of living out there would have had the temerity to come into this chamber and vote against price relief for Australian families. Order. So if you want to talk Order. about who's not in touch, have a look in the Order. mirror, Senator Cash. Um, Senator Cash, first supplementary. Uh, thank you very much. And Minister, can you name anywhere in Australia where electricity prices have gone down 
since the Albanese government was elected. Minister. Well, I know that everywhere in Australia is probably going to have, would have had higher prices were you right. in government. Exactly. Uh, that's what we do know. Uh, uh, and we know that prices would have risen by less than they would have as a result of the government's policy, which you voted against. Order. Uh, and Order. You have, those opposite, not only, not only did they vote Order. against price relief, Order. not only did they vote against price Senator relief, Wong. they also think that the way you do with energy Senator price— Wong. Order. It is not appropriate for the noise levels to go— Senator Birmingham, I have called the chamber to order. It is not appropriate for the noise level in here to get so loud that the senator can't hear me calling her to order. It is not appropriate to shout across the chamber on both sides. I would ask senators to listen respectfully. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Not, not only do they think uh, those opposite uh, president think that an answer to rising prices is to vote against price relief, yeah. they think an answer to rising prices is to hide them. Yeah. Hide them. Before the last election, their response Order. to rising energy Order. prices was Senator just not let's, let's, let's change what the DMO actually uh, is disclosed to be. Uh, that's what Mr Taylor did. Well, we on this, th we on this side Order. understand what families are facing and we're trying to do something Thank you, about it. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Cash, first supplementary. Final supplementary. Why hasn't, Minister, the Prime Minister delivered on his promise to reduce electricity bills by $275, a promise that he made 97 times prior to the election? Why does everything always cost more under Labor. Order. Order. Before I order. Order. Before Minister, I haven't called you. Before I call the Minister, Senator Polly. Senator Polly, I'm calling you to order. It doesn't require a response. Minister, please uh, Minister, please re Minister, please continue. Uh, let's Let's talk about the default market offer that the Australian Energy Regulator published, the, the draft DMO for 2324. Uh, and what that showed, and this, this, this is what's happening to energy prices, uh, that the DMO will rise up to 22 per cent for households, up to 25 per cent for businesses. That is a substantial increase. But what it also showed is without coal and gas price caps that you voted against, the price increase would have been 51 per cent and 53 per cent. 51 per cent and 53 per cent. And that's what Wong, they would. Please resume your seat. It is, as Senator Cash, it is not appropriate to interject in such a loud voice as to try and outcompete the minister. She's been asked a question. She's entitled to answer it, and she's entitled to, it, to uh, senators listening respectfully and silently. Minister, please continue. I'll just repeat that, that without the coal and gas price caps that those opposite voted against, the price increases that Australians would have faced, households and businesses would have been 51 per cent and 53 per cent, respectively. Yeah. So, uh, if anybody wants to come Order. in here and Order. suggest they're out of touch, I suggest they all to, those opposite should look in a mirror. And I Thank ask you, the Senator president Walker. that further questions be placed on notice. Order, order, senators. I was asked. I was asked to review the tape in relation to a matter that occurred on Tuesday. I have been asked to review the Hansard of a series of exchanges during a speech by Senator Thorpe on the Safeguard Mechanisms Crediting Amendment Bill on 28 March 2023. In effect, the chair had conflicting points of order before her, but was unable to deal with either of them because the chamber descended into disorder. This included Senator Hughes disregarding the chair by persistently interjecting and Senator Thorpe repeating an accusation before the chair had been able to rule on it. It is unacceptable that senators continue to disregard the authority of the chair while points of orders are raised and determined. This is happening far too often. 
the Deputy President and I will be looking to all senators in this place, and particularly senators in leadership positions, to assist in reversing this trend. Consistent with this, I intend to take a firm line in calling the chamber to order, particularly in question time. In order to preserve the dignity of the chamber, I remind all senators of the behaviour codes and your endorsement of these codes in this chamber and the other place. It was appropriate in the circumstances for the chair to refer the matter to me for review. At the outset, I would like to praise the way Senator Reynolds managed the disorder in the chamber. She did so in a dignified and calm way that sought to take the heat out of the situation when she was regret regrettably placed in a very difficult position. The Hansard records Senator Hughes commenting about Senator Thorpe acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land she was discussing. In response, Senator Thorpe asked the chair, is that racism? Can I just call out racism in the chamber right now? Senator Hughes, on a point of order, said, we've just had an accusation made in this chamber and I would like Senator Thorpe to withdraw. The matter involves the interpretation of Standing Order 193. Standing Order 1933 prohibits offensive words, imputations of improper motives and personal reflections against senators and members. It revolves around the idea that there should be constraints on language directed to other senators or members. This is in intended to ensure that political debate is conducted in the privileged forum of parliament without personally offensive language. This raises the question of what constitutes personally offensive language. Odges says, and I quote, it is for the chair to determine what constitutes offensive words, imputations of improper motives and personal reflections under this standing order. In doing so, the chair has regard to the connotations of expressions and the context in which they are used. In other words, the rule isn't necessarily about particular words or expressions. It's about the use of such words in context. It is for the chair to determine whether, in all circumstances, the language amounts to offensive words, imputations of improper motives or personal reflections directed to a senator. I now turn to Tuesday. First, a statement directed to a senator accusing them of being racist breaches Standing Order 1933. Any such personal reflection upon another senator or a member of the House is highly disorderly and, if made, should be withdrawn. I am not sure that a senator asking, is this racism, in response to an interjection, necessarily breaches that standing order. It would depend on circumstances. However, Senator Thorpe subsequently made a direct personal reflection upon Senator Hughes, which should be withdrawn. Senator Thorpe asked the chair to consider whether particular language used was racist. As the chair indicated, it is not generally the role of a chair to judge the character of language used by senators unless it breaches some rule of the Senate. In discussing Standing Order 1933, Odges says the chair um, does not normally require the withdrawal of words unless the chair has determined they are contrary to the standing order. But if a senator finds a remark personally offensive and considers himself or herself personally aggrieved, the chair may require its withdrawal to preserve the dignity of debate. In making these judgments, it is relevant for chairs to consider whether words may be particularly offensive to another senator because of their personal attributes or experience. However, it is incumbent on every senator to demonstrate a level of respect for their colleagues, which ensures that chairs are not required to adjudicate such matters. In relation to the interjection from Senator Hughes, the Hansard records what appears to be a derogatory comment about the practice of acknowledging country at the same time as Senator, Hawke, Senator Thorpe was acknowledging the custodians of particular land. As Senator Thorpe clearly found that to be personally offensive, 
I consider there would have been grounds for the chair to seek to have Senator Hughes clarify or withdraw her remarks. However, because of the subsequent disorder, that was not possible. In those circumstances, I think it would be appropriate for Senator Hughes to either withdraw or clarify her remarks. For absolute clarity, I am asking that Senator with, beg your pardon, I am asking that Senator Thorpe withdrew, withdraw her comments to Senator Hughes, and for Senator Hughes to either withdraw her comments to Senator Thorpe or clarify those comments. Finally, I endorse the comments of former President Ryan, who said, "The standing orders and rules of this place are limits, not guides. Just because something can be said or done." does not mean it should be. Common decency cannot be codified. It depends on all of us considering the impact of our behaviour on others. While this workplace isn't like a normal one, it is still a place where we must all work together, even across issues of profound disagreement. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hughes. Senator. Uh if I can, I would just like to acknowledge and thank you for looking at this matter and for coming back to the, House, to the Senate with that statement. And in order to maintain the dignity of the chamber, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Um, Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, President. In question time on Tuesday, the 28th of March, I took elements of a question asked by Senator Lambie to me on notice. I've written to Senator Lambie to provide a complete answer, and I now table that answer for the information of the Senate. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Brockman. To take notice of answers given by Labor ministers to all coalition questions. Well, I mean, I'm not sure if the jury was out before uh, Shadow Minister Birmingham's question to Minister Farrell about whether he was the worst trade minister ever, but now the jury is certainly in. I mean. The fact that he can say, when you have the global chair, Uida Sun, of INPEX, talking in this place, talking in the Australian Parliament about the damage the Labor government has done to our trade relationship with Japan, and he just blows it off. He just acts as though that speech never happened. I mean, that is an extraordinary performance of a minister who is meant to be championing and, and defending the trading relationships of this country. And this is not just one of our most important trade relationships with the nation of Japan. It's one of our most important relationships in a geopolitical sense. We have the global chair of a major corporation coming to this place and saying, and I quote, certainty in policy direction and a stable regulatory framework will continue to encourage strong investment in Australia. Unfortunately, the investment climate in Australia appears to be deteriorating. Now, I think everyone in this place would agree that the Japanese, in cultural terms, when they're speaking diplomatically, consider every single word they say extraordinarily carefully every single word they say. And for a global chair of a Japanese corporation, which is a major investor in this country, to say that it shows how far this government has deteriorated a key trading relationship in just a few short months of being in government. Heaven help us. Heaven help us after they've had the reins for a couple more years. What damage is this government going to do with our international trading relationships? And this isn't a minor industry. This is a key industry for Australia. 
The gas industry is a key industry for my home state of Western Australia. And foreign investment is a key driver of that industry. We need foreign investment to underpin the, the economic development of this country. Back, we go back to the 1970s when uh, particularly Japanese investment into Western Australia saw the development of our great gas industry. And we've seen this government in 10 short months, 10 short months, destroy 50 years of relationship building, of being a reliable, a stable, a, a, a a key trading partner in the gas space with these major international corporations. And it's not just about the dollars that flow, though it is a great export earner for this country. It's a great employer in Western Australia and the Northern Territory. Uh, it, it, you know, it's just a wonderful industry. But it's also about energy security for one of our key strategic partners. Japan is one of our key and most enduring strategic partners, certainly in this region. Uh, and for the government to trash that relationship, trash that relationship to the point where you have a global CEO speaking in this place, talking about the damage that's been done. Let me quote a little bit more from the speech. Let me quote a little bit more. In Japan, we say, don't cheat at rock, paper, scissors. This translates to don't move the goalposts after the game has started. Here we have one of our key trading partners saying that we, Australia, is cheating at rock, paper, scissors. And the trade minister stands up in this place and denies, just oblivious, He's oblivious to reality. He denies the fact that this government, this Labor government, is having a negative impact on our key trading relationships. And they've got form. They're damaging key trading relationships in the Middle East through their decision to ban the live export sheep trade. They're damaging our relationship with Japan, Taiwan, South Korea. These are key relationships. Senator Craighead. Um, well, I am delighted to rise and take note of uh, some of the questions and responses that we heard in question time today, particularly having an opportunity to talk about how the Labor government is powering Australian communities with batteries, and not just individual batteries, but a community, community batteries, where we can actually, you, we can actually power support powering so many homes, 100,000 homes will benefit from this, uh, from this initiative. There are uh, 400 batteries to roll out and they will power entire communities. They will help entire communities to lower their electricity prices, which I'm very, very proud of. One in three Australian households have solar panels, but very few have batteries. This community approach to powering our homes is going to make a big difference out there. Um, and these things will help us get to net zero. Now, there were a number of questions in question time today that went to the issue of net zero. It was mentioned on a number of occasions. And when I look around this chamber, we know that the majority of people in this chamber, in the Australian Senate, are right behind the idea of net zero. And although it would be difficult to, uh, to have seen on the face of it, following the last couple of days of debate around the safeguard mechanism, there are even some people on the coalition benches that believe in net zero. But you wouldn't have thought it if you'd been listening to the conversation in here over the last number of days. But that is where we need to get to, and the safeguard mechanism is another element that is going to help us get there. The safeguard mechanism that passed this chamber earlier today, after 10 long years, 10 long years of having so much uncertainty, so much uncertainty, and the safeguard mechanism when put in by the coalition when they were in government, 
did nothing to reduce emissions, and its entire intent is to reduce emissions. But it did not. Emissions went up. And you'd have to ask yourself, why was that? And I think it was probably because <laughs> um, there was no intention to do it in the first place. Set up a mechanism and then set your baseline so high, so high, that nobody's coming down, which totally goes against the grain, totally goes against the intent. So I'm delighted that today this parliament has passed that bill and the safeguard mechanism will kick in on the 1st of July. And as we saw last year when the 43 per cent target was legislated in this parliament, we saw investment go up. We have seen organisation after organisation come and, and talk about how much the certainty matters, the importance of certainty. So the whole thing about moving the goalposts, well, let's put the goalposts in the ground first, shall we? And the goalposts in the ground about where we're going and how we're getting there has seen a tick up in investment. So we know that with the safeguard mechanism, 80 per cent of the organisations that are captured, <clears throat> 80 per cent of those are actually already committed to net zero. So they've made that commitment. You know, over 80 per cent of them made that commitment, along with the majority of people in this parliament. So for the last couple of days and through question time, listening to all of the puff and waffle, the facts are the Australian public placed Labor in government. And these are the things that we will pursue. We will pursue renewable energy. We will pursue reducing emissions. We will pursue stronger relationships internationally. We will pursue that investment. And that is exactly where we're going, with a broad vision that will make a fundamental difference to the people in this country, while you just keep bleating on about Senator small Crogan. issues. Senator Chandler. Small issues. Goodness gracious me, um, Deputy President. I, I, I honestly thought I'd heard it all um, this week and, and over this last sitting fortnight, but for Labor senators to be um, describing the cost of living crisis as just a small issue um, really does take the cake at almost 3.30 on the last Thursday on the last Thursday of the sitting fortnight. Um, and look, I think um, many Australians listening into Parliament over the last fortnight wouldn't have been particularly impressed by some of what we're hearing. Um, it's been another Another week, another sitting day, more broken promises from the government, more dirty deals to get their legislation through this place um, because we have a government that is just unable to deliver on the commitments that they made during the election. Um, they promised to cut electricity bills by $275. They promised Australians cheaper mortgages. They promised there would be no changes to superannuation and they promised that Australians could expect to see their cost of living expenses go down. But um, since then, we have just seen the complete opposite of all of those things, um, things occurring. It's just rank hypocrisy from the government. And, and this week, and, and I note um, in Senator Rustin's first question um, in question time today, this week we've seen yet another one. This was a government that promised uh, transparency and accountability and integrity and all of these things, um, the, these commitments that they made to the Australian people um, in the lead up to the election last year, they, they promised to be a, a government of integrity. And yet we now have a situation where it has come to light that the uh, mobile black spot program, um, which has been used to great effect previously to um, support local communities with necessary communications infrastructure um, is now being used to direct funding to um, 
a number of seats that are all Labor held seats. 27 out of 27 grants in New South Wales under this funding stream went to Labor seats. Um, there were only three locations selected in Victoria. They went to Labor seats. Um, the minister has directed that 40 out of the 54 chosen sites in the most recent uh, mobile black spot program, $40 million round, are going to locations in Labor seats. This was a government that promised that it was going to do better. This was a government that promised integrity and transparency and accountability. And quite frankly, Deputy President, I just don't think that that is what um, transparency and accountability and integrity looks like. But like I said, um, this is just another one in the long list of broken promises from this government that is just piling up and piling up and piling up. Uh, it is amazing how fast the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese changed his tune from when he was telling Australians that their lives would be easier under a Labor government during the election campaign to then being in government and systematically going back on key election commitments he made. At one point he even stated, and I quote, if you make a promise and a commitment, you do have to stick to it. Well, that sounds like stating the, the very obvious. Um, but the Prime Minister hasn't really stuck to his word, has he? It doesn't stop there. This week we have seen more scheming and broken promises from this government. In doing their deal with the Greens to push through their safeguard mechanism reforms, Labor will inflict further pain on Australians. Instead of working to make life easier for Australians, which I'm sure is something they're probably committed to do during the election campaign as well, Labor has again put the Australian people last. They have capitulated to the demands of the Greens in putting the safeguard mechanism through this place this week and sown the seeds for not only the next energy crisis in this country but the next economic crisis in this country. And we know the impact that that is going to have on hardworking Australians and their families. This Labor Green deal is a hard cap on economic growth. It is a hard cap on new industries. It is a hard cap on existing industries, and it is a hard cap on hard cap on jobs. It will cast doubt over new mining and gas projects, which are going to which have the potential, rather, to provide energy security. These projects are necessary for the production of renewable technologies mm -hmm. and projects that will help drive down energy prices. And yet, Labor in bed with the Greens are doing everything they can to completely run these projects off the road. Apparently lowering the cost of electricity isn't that much of a concern for Labor anymore. All this deal is going to accomplish is irreparable damage to the energy market and it will penalise consumers because apparently consumers haven't suffered enough already under this government. If only they'd found it within themselves to pass on the $275 decrease to our power bills, maybe we wouldn't be in this position. Senator White. How good is the community battery grant scheme? It is absolutely fantastic, and it is being rolled out across this country uh, in, in communities. It is, it is the Albanese government uh, delivering on an election commi commitment to, to roll out 400 batteries in neighbourhoods across the country, delivering more affordable and secure solar power to more Australians. It is a fantastic program which will allow ordinary Australians to store affordable solar energy for use during peak times and to share excess power with other households in their area. Areas like Aston in outer Melbourne, uh, a, typical, uh, work, a typical area uh, in outer Melbourne which is facing an election this Saturday where they'll be weighing up the sort of programs and the, the way in which the Albanese government runs programs like the Community Battery Grant. Programs where you can clearly see what the what the uh, the uh, what you need to do to get a community battery. We're on a website. We're on websites. It talks about how you apply, what the criteria are, and how how you uh, you could be successful. Uh, the people of Aston would appreciate that, I am sure, because in the past, you know, they've had a, a member of parliament who was involved in a significant uh, robo debt scheme, partially an architect of that, uh, and they've also seen sports rorts where the, the grant schemes were administered through colour-coded. Uh, spreadsheets. So the, I'm sure in Aston, it, the families of Aston will be weighing those sort of thing, those things up. Of course, it's, it, it is a, a difficult to win uh, a by-election as a government, but I'm, and in fact, there hasn't been a, a, a winning 
uh, by-election by a government for about 100 years, since 1920. But I'm sure the, the provision of the community battery uh, grant and the way it's being administered by this government will be something that's weighing on the minds of Aston residents as they think about what they had, pre what the government that they had previously, how grants had been previously administered, and they compare that to this fantastic community battery grant scheme that has already seen 58 community batteries uh, in, uh, grants uh, awarded, uh, and where clear guidelines have been available, and where they will know that it is possible for their community to have these batteries, uh, the, these battery grants. They know that they, they, they will be offered by an, a group, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, ARENA, and you know, there will be a program to deliver the rest of those batteries. The, three other, the 342 other batteries uh, that the government has committed to, uh, at which will be done with stakeholder uh, consultation and will be done with clear guidelines that people can follow and they can see tra the transparency of uh, how they are delivered. As uh, my colleague Senator Grogan said, you know, one in every three Australian ho households have solar panels. That is one of the highest rates in the world. And there are lots of solar panels, can I tell you, in Aston. I've been out there many times. And there are lots of people who have taken up solar panels and they will be looking forward to and are looking forward to things like the Community Battery Grant Scheme and, and whether they can apply for them and whether they can be successful. And really, community batteries uh, are, are going to allow the storage of energy and sharing with others, so your neighbours, and, and you can also install roof, you know, it's not just rooftop solar. So what this program is doing uh, transparently is putting downward pressure on household electricity costs, it's going to contribute to lower emissions, it's going to provide a benefit to the electricity network, store solar energy for later use using or sharing and uh, support further uh, solar institutions. Uh, installations, it's going to, and it's going to allow households like those in Aston that cannot install solar panels to enjoy the benefits of renewable energy through shared community storage. That's what's going to be one of the things that's going to be weighing on the minds of the good voters of Aston this weekend. Um, not, not only what the government has already delivered, what we will deliver, and also that they have got a fantastic candidate in Mary Doyle uh, in Aston who will be able to prosecute um, their, their needs and represent them. And it's my great hope that uh, on this weekend she gets elected to the members of Aston. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I want to address two of the questions that were asked today, and they were both directed at uh, Senator Wong, Minister Wong. Uh, first one was from uh, Coalition Senator Senator Rustin, and the second one was from Senator Cash. Now, uh, I've got to say, I think most of us on this side really rate the question time performance of Minister Wong when she comes in here. She's uh, um, very good at, uh, at uh, standing up and uh, delivering uh, a response to, uh, to questions that are given. I wouldn't say they are necessarily answers because we, are, we ask questions and they're obviously, sometimes they're uh, uh, darted and, and, and moving around and there's a bit, bit, uh, not, not, not too much direct uh, response to, to the questions that are asked. But uh, the, the first question went to a very serious issue that's emerged, something that's been revealed uh, recently, which is in relation to the Black Spot program. And Senator Wong was asked about that. And uh, sadly, from her response, uh, what I'm getting is flashbacks of what uh, Labor is traditionally known for. Uh, the, the, what, they've, what we've got here is a situation where Labor uh, have already conceded that 27 out of the 27 black spot program allocations in New South Wales are all in Labor-held seats. And we've seen previous governments, previous administrations of the Labor kind, uh, have this in their history, this in their pattern, where they deliver programs essentially pork barrelling into their, into their own seats in order to get an electoral gain come election day. Now, the minister admitted, the minister admitted uh, that, uh, that, that, that the minister involved with this program, that they, she personally selected every spot. Now, I imagine she has a map of Liberal and National electorates 
uh, in, uh, in, in front as she ensured that the uh, constituents of those electorates would not benefit from that program. Now, it so happens that a lot of black spot areas are actually in Liberal and national seats because they're often in rural and regional areas where you know we, we tend to good, a good, get a good vote there uh, by, with the liberal and national vote, and so no doubt that's what's happened. And uh, this mob over here, they, they like to point the finger, but I remind those opposite that they are and always have been the worst kind of offenders. They just do it particularly artfully, I've got to say. Now, the Mobile Black Spot program is designed to provide funding to improve mobile coverage in areas outside of the metropolitan area. In this round, the Communications Minister personally selected all 54 locations to receive funding. None of the locations were chosen based on departmental advice. None! of them were chosen. Of the 54 locations chosen by Minister Rowland, three quarters were in Labor electorates, despite Labor holding just a third of the regional seats in New South Wales. 100 per cent, 100 per cent of the 27 locations chosen by the Minister were in Labor electorates. In Victoria, three selected locations were in ALP seats. This program, this selection, uh, with the round six of the mobile blocks, black spot program is dodgy. It is dodgy. It is dodgy. It, I must point out the, the sheer hypocrisy of, uh, of this government. Now, I want to read you a quote, and I'll, give you, I'll, I'll see if you can guess who might have said it. Uh, uh, Senator Scar and uh, Senator, Senator Cash in here. And, uh, the taxpayer funds, taxpayer funds are ones that are paid for by hard workers they deserve better than to have their taxpayer funds from their hard work funneled into marginal electorates uh, than to have sorry than, the, better than to have their taxpayer funds from their hard funneled into marginal electorates on the basis of a political whim we need governments to be held to account for their actions Sounds like prime minister albanese prime minister albanese that is right prime minister albanese said that when he was the opposition leader when he was the opposition leader the prime minister said this in 2021 2021 now the other point i did say i wanted to touch on senator cash's uh, question uh, which went to the electricity prices now minister wong was asked if she was in touch with the cost of, of electricity, and her answer demonstrated that she actually doesn't. They, they point every time we're asking these questions to their, uh, their, their, their policy they rushed through the parliament just before Christmas. Just before Christmas. Now, they, if it was so successful, Labor, if it was so successful, then why don't you explain to the Australian people why their electricity prices have actually gone up? And why don't you explain how it's not doing anything to actually deliver on the reduction of price that you said you would deliver 97 times before the election that it would go down by $275. I put the question into the motion moved by Senator Brockman. Those for the question say aye against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Note of uh, Senator Wong's uh, answers to questions asked by Senator Shoebridge. Today, Senator Shoebridge, on behalf of the Australian Greens, asked a very important question. Also, on behalf of millions of Australians and even more people around the world, did our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, raise the political persecution and freeing of Julian Assange with the American President and the UK Prime Minister when he met with them two weeks ago? And the answer we had from Senator Wong was that somehow we can't intervene in the extradition of Julian Assange because there are legal processes underway. I wanted to deal with two things here. Firstly, Senator Wong didn't want to answer the question. She didn't want to say yes or no where the Prime Minister raised it. I'll draw my own conclusions from that, as will the Australian people. The answer is almost certainly it wasn't raised with the American President or the UK Prime Minister. The two men, in fact the three men together, who can make a decision to free Julian Assange? Secondly, what Senator Wong said in here was rubbish. It is patently false that for some legal process underway prevents a political intervention on behalf of Julian Assange. Let me make this really clear to the Australian Senate. Julian Assange is a political prisoner, and only a political intervention will free him. 
Our Prime Minister could ask the US President to drop the extradition charges, even while they're underway. And that's it. Mr Assange will finally walk free. We also know in the UK that once a court makes its decision, the final decision on extradition lies with the Prime Minister and the Attorney General. Once again, a political decision. So why didn't Mr Albanese raise this with the UK Prime Minister or the US President? He could have ended it two weeks ago for Mr Assange, who's sitting in a maximum security prison, Belmarsh Prison, in the UK, for telling the truth. For senators who aren't aware, he is being extradited to the US on espionage charges. The first foreign journalist conducting an activity on foreign soil to ever be extradited to the US. This is not only a massive breach of the US First Amendment, politically persecuting a journalist for doing their job. This is an attack on press freedoms all around the planet. The stakes couldn't be higher around the extradition of Julian Assange. And once again, the Australian Greens will stand up in the Australian Parliament for Julian Assange, for his family, Mr John Shipton, who continually comes into Parliament and tries to get meetings with members of Parliament, who works with the Parliamentary Friends of Assange Group. And I'd, not, I'd like to acknowledge the work that the Parliamentary Friends of Assange Group do on behalf of Mr Assange, right across the political spectrum, not just here in Australia, but in parliaments uh, all around the world, these groups are forming. And as Senator Wong did acknowledge in her question today, there is a very strong public sentiment in this country to free Mr Assange, an Australian citizen, a publisher who was just doing his job. Senators, we can't let this stand on our watch, that an Australian citizen is seeking his freedom for doing his job, and our government does nothing. Mr Albanese said he agrees enough is enough and wants to see Mr Assange released. Senator Wong has expressed similar sentiments, and they've called for quiet diplomacy. And as my colleague Senator Shoebridge asked so well in here today, why are we not putting the question when the three men are together behind closed doors that couldn't be, there couldn't be a better example of quiet diplomacy than those three men discussing the freedom of Julian Assange. So Australians will be very disappointed if Prime Minister Anthony Albanese didn't raise this. And unfortunately, it appears from Senator Wong's non-answer to Senator Shoebridge's question today that this issue wasn't clearly enough of a priority for the Prime Minister. So the campaign goes on to keep putting pressure on the Prime Minister and President Biden in the US and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Prime Minister Sunak, to free Julian Assange. And I call on all Australian people who care about democracy and press freedoms to, to continue to push their MPs to bring Julian Assange home. I put the question that the motion moved by Senator Wishwilson be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it.